This is Andy Gutierrez from StarWars.com, and you are listening to Coffee with Kenobi with Dan Z. This is the podcast you're looking for. This is Vanessa Marshall, Harrison Dula from Star Wars Rebels, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi. Hello, my friends, and welcome to Coffee with Kenobi, show number 434. This is your spoiler-free place for Star Wars discussion, analysis, and rhetoric. I'm your host, Dan Z, drinking One Nation coffee out of my Rancho Obi-Wan coffee mug. Thrilled to be talking Star Wars with each and every one of you. On today's show, David Motters of Star Wars Reactions and Tom Gross of CWK Pourover join me to discuss the 10th episode in Season 1 of The Bad Batch, Common Ground. So pull up a chair, grab your favorite coffee mug, and let's have some coffee with Kenobi. So who talks first? You talk first? I talk first. Joining us today for a cup of coffee to talk about the 10th episode in Season 1 of The Bad Batch, Common Ground, we have two guest co-hosts. First, Let's bring in from Star Wars Reactions, David Motters. David, welcome back to the show, my friend. Well, thanks for having me back. It's good to be on with you guys. It is good to have you on. And of course, uh, as listeners know, David was one of the people in attendance at the Coffee with Kenobi meetup last week at Disney Springs. And my gosh, but it was great to see you, give you a big hug, and just, just spend time with you and Aaron and everybody else. I had the best time. That was really filled my cup. Oh, it was incredible. Like I said, we needed Tom there. We needed Corey there. But uh, it was really neat to not only shake people's hands, but like you said, Dan, um, just to give big hugs to people. And uh, yeah. it was just, it was great. The turnout was great. Uh, the weather cooperated. And uh, we stayed way later than I thought we would. And I'm glad we did. Me too. Me too. We closed that place down, didn't we? That's Speaking right. of a guy who's closed down a place or two in his time. Let's bring in our <laughs> bring in the host of co-host of CWK Prover, Tom Gross. Well, hello everybody, and yes, closing down places was a specialty of mine at one time. But uh, <laughs> hey, uh, oh, I have to say, Dave, when you said the big hugs part, oh, there was just like oh, kind of a, a, a hopeful emptiness in my heart that I can't wait mm -hmm. to get to a place where I can do that with all of you guys. And, and just, uh, man, I guess next May, huh? Maybe maybe we'll find some times ahead of that, but uh, definitely next May when Celebration rolls back around. Here, here. Looking forward to that. All right, so uh, we start out the episode, the 10th episode of of this first interesting and, and, and often captivating season. Uh we're on the planet Raxus, and there is a presentation going on. As we as we scan, as we pan down, we see this beautiful foliage and foliage, foliage. How do you say that? Foliage. Foliage, I believe. Foliage. Okay, foliage. That's okay. I'll go either way, though. Potato, potato, zare, zare, you know, whatever. <laughs> uh, so it's gorgeous. The, the orange, uh, the bright colors popping, but there's a lot of civil unrest, but I don't know. I, I have a lot I want to say about this opening sequence. I think it pounds a, a lot of punch in a quick episode. But David, let's start with you. Uh, talk about the opening sequence. Up, not let's not talk about his speech yet, but just kind of leading up to that speech. Well, it's interesting how Captain Bragg starts with you know a, a line that you don't want to start with, which is the enemy or the Empire is we're not your enemy, and she's immediately saying it. We're your enemy, and. Um, one of my thoughts as you see this all unfold is I just thought to myself, you're all too late. The The Republic was too late. Here's a separatist capital. You know, you're too late. And um, it's, it's, I, I just, you just feel it in your gut. You're like these, these, whether he wants to be a pawn or not, um, they are. And uh, they're there. And when the, uh, the ATTEs roll in, that is a serious sign of intimidation. And so it's it's sad to see it. It really is. Uh, Senator Avi Singh is is the senator here with, with the most wonderful set of mutton chops I think I've ever seen. <laughs> Very channeled as inner Pablo Hidalgo, I would say. But what I love about this, Tom, is for since 1999, or actually since more like since 2002, We've seen the separatists really as the bad guys, right? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. The instigators of the Clone Wars, or at least the puppets of the Clone Wars, really. But in this episode, we really see it from a, a different point of view. 
it shows us that life is all about perspective, right? The separatists in this particular episode, uh, Senator Avi Singh is very much a victim as much as anybody in the Clone Wars or in the, in the galactic struggle sure. between the, re- the eventual rebellion and the Empire. I really liked that perspective. And I also liked that the first 10 minutes, this felt like an episode of season four or something from the Clone Wars. It, w- it, was, it was that captivating to me. Yeah, I... I don't know. There's so much about this opening, and Dave, you 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 you, you said what exactly what I wrote down, and that is the line: "The Empire is not your enemy." You know, when you hear that, then you're you're facing your enemy. Yep. But uh, the thing I wanted to, to say about this opening, and um, and I'll tie it around to what you're saying, Dan, is when they when they open with that beautiful animated, I just the the spread of the entire city with the with the capital and the streets and you can even see in that far away the uh uh the courtyard in which they're you know where we're headed it just you know it just reminds me of the talent and the skill and the the love for the story that the animators have um that that opening just drew me right in um i just i was so i was so taken by that beauty and then to be slapped right across the face by seeing the imperial occupation um with the i don't know if she's a commander or what i don't recall what what rank she is when she steps to the forefront and says those lines she's captain she's captain and then um thank you and then of course you have Oh, Avi saying again, the senator is 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 being used as a puppet, as he was through the entire Clone Wars. Um, he's told to step forward, but we get that sense of uh, uh, the conflict inside of him as he as he whispers to his his droid G uh, G S eight, I believe, is that uh, correct? The, the name of the droid, um, and and the droid questioning um, his what uh, how how what how, what would go wrong? What what could possibly go wrong here? And he steps forward and he addresses the audience. And it's clearly an audience that is in f- not in favor of the empire. They were jeering. And when you look at the captions, and again, I have to go back to that, Dan, you, you brought me, you, you, you made me start doing captions. and I love it because you see at the bottom, you know, it says crowd jeering. And then it switches to ca- crowd cheering when he steps up there. And then he starts this, this, he starts the imperial speech but then makes that the, what we see is the heroic, you know, uh, he's not going to be a puppet anymore. He's been pushed around too many times and he's going to put his foot down. And of course, immediately he's arrested. Yeah. Um, I just think, you know, it's, it's such a turn of events from the opening shot to that moment where you just have a lot of twisting of feelings and everything um, before we, before we even get the real feel for what this episode's all about. Yeah, it's, I think it's so key to see, again, the perspective is so important. It's so important. Yep. We're suddenly empathizing with the Separatists, but that, of course, is going to be harder for the main characters in the story. And we're going to get to that. Uh, Singh has this wonderfully wonderful dramatic speech. He gets arrested and taken away. The walkers show up, as you mentioned, David, very intimidating. Uh, but there's no time to dwell on that because we shift instantly over to Clone Force 99. We've got Wrecker and Omega munching on Mantel mix, which I thought was extra painful because that wasn't actually available at Galaxy's Edge last week. But you know, <laughs> I'll send my letter to Bob, my letter to Bob Chapek later, and we'll see what we can do about that. <laughs> uh, but so th- there's there's an interesting thing that happens. You, you see the lightheartedness of the two of them, and then David right away, uh, Hunter and o- Omega have a conversation about basically Omega's current place. Uh, with Clone Force 99. Go ahead and talk about that conversation. Yeah, it's interesting because she reminds them that she's part of the squad. They told her that, you know, in an earlier episode. And so, again, me as a psychologist and as a parent, I it seems like a back and forth kind of thing that they're presenting here. Uh, I know on a previous, um, you know, episode that I heard, you know, you, Dan, and Tom talking about when they're, they're on that moon and, and diving down into, you know, crevices and would we allow our son or daughter to be there? Um, absolutely not. Uh, and even, you know, Aaron and I talked about it on our episode of uh, covering that particular situation. But now they're sitting there saying that because you have two, uh, you know, deadly bounty hunters on your trail, we need to lay low. 
So it's kind of a back and forth kind of thing. I'm not quite sure where they want to land on this. Um, I know we'll get to it at the end, but it's even a maybe a switch there, ultimately, depending on how that game of Jarek played out. But um, she wants to be a part of it. She wants to have agency. She wants to um, contribute. You know, she even says it. She wants to be useful. Uh, but I do think they do a, a neat job of, uh, of bringing that about via her interactions with Sid, as, as we'll talk about here in just a little bit. But uh, a little bit of inconsistency there in terms of what Hunter and the Bad Batch want to do in terms of protecting her. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. She he, eventually, I think Hunter's like, well, I'm going to at least try this perspective. I'm going to try this angle. We're going to keep you home. Omega doesn't love that. She's going to end up uh, staying with Sid. But then Tom, I, I really like when they find out the mission from Sid. Uh, before we get to the mission though, are you guys tired of the nicknames headband? And I mean, I, I mean, I feel like, you know, once or twice you say it, or if you change up the nicknames once in a while, Okay, but I feel like we're, we're we're treading ground that I'm just not really comfortable about. Now, is it insulting to call somebody <laughs> headband? No, but it's it's demeaning to not take the name of the person. And I, I, this this particular act for me is wearing kind of thin. I don't know how you guys feel. Is it not? I I just assumed it's sort of intentional. Um, because yeah, so sure. what what soldier would want a com a commoner? Uh, calling them nicknames. I mean, if this were their own soldier nicknames, Bandana, Goggles, um, I forget what she calls Wrecker, but uh, um, that 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 would be one thing. But this is a this is an outsider using uh, these names, and they're being awful patient with her, but they also mm-hmm. need her too. So mm-hmm. I don't know. I, I to me, I feel like I, I'm with you, Dan. I'm I'm really getting kind of irritated. I snicker every now and then, but then I kind of get tired of it. But I I, I sense that there's, I, th- I think we're supposed to be frustrated with her, um, at mm-hmm. this point for for lots of reasons, not just because because she, she doesn't treat. I think we're getting to this, but she doesn't treat Omega very well on the surface, uh, through this episode. So I kind of was like, mm, I think I think we're supposed to start feeling irritated with her. Yeah, it, it's definitely working. David, you want to say anything on that? Yeah, I agree. You know, after she did goggles the first time and she called uh, Hunter dark and broody, I, I liked mm-hmm. it. It was funny. It was, yeah. It was, it, was, it, was, it was nice. But over the last couple episodes, no, it's okay. I, you can call them by their names. Right. Or at least come up with a different nickname, right? Yeah. <laughs> vary, vary it up. <laughs> vary it up a little bit. So then we've got the, the initial meeting, which is basically – Hey, uh, you've got to break out this center. You got to break out Avi Singh. Echo's got a problem with that, David. And at first blush, I was wondering, what is Echo's problem? But then it hit me what his problem actually is. Um, go ahead and weigh on that. I want to hear what Tom thinks about that one as well. Oh, sure. I mean, he speaks up first. And the first thing I thought about is him being, um, you know, basically blown up almost, or, or a lot of him uh, back in the Clone Wars when they were on the Citadel. And then of course, last season in season seven of the Clone Wars, we see the return of, of Echo and we see what the separatists um, and in particular the techno union do to him, which is just, it's, it's just, it's just unbelievable when you see it. I'm so thankful they saved him. Uh, However, you can see that because of what he had done to him. And of course he's got that prosthetic, you know, in his, Right, right arm, right arm is a prosthetic. I so. no. um, you can see why he has such a visceral reaction to this um, because of his history. Uh, Tom, yeah, anything I, you want to add? Yeah. Um, no, I just I thought it was I, I I keep going back to you know Echo Echo is the reg. He is the soldier. He's the grunt, and so it's to me it's only natural that he would have that feelings for all the all the reasons you said, David. But um, but I felt like even Clone Force ninety nine had quite a bit of reservation as well. I think Hunter, in fact, didn't Hunter even imply that maybe they would turn this one down? And she she says something like, "You need this," or you saw, I don't remember what it was. Um, but there was a lot of reservation on on all of their parts. I thought, but yeah, Echo definitely. And I again, I think I as David said, it's it's hard. I would be hard. I. It would be hard not for him to do to have that feeling. I mean, you would. It would certainly be 
rational to, and you've talked about this on, on Star Wars reactions in your great psychology corner column that, or I guess it's not a column, but in, you know, when you're set your segment on Star Wars reactions with Aaron, where of course he's got to have PTSD for what's happened mm. to him. Mm. Right. And the hunter starts off by saying, Oh, you want us to work with a separatist? No, he doesn't say hard pass, but that's what he, that's what he means. There's no way I'm going to do that. I'm not going to mm. rescue any separatists, but again, that's why the beginning is so crucial because we see, Yes, the separatists are bad. Yes, Count Dooku, all that good stuff. But that doesn't mean everybody's got the same ideology. It doesn't mean everybody has the same point of view and perspective and the, and the same capacity for violence or degradation of society. And the fact that they struggle with that through a good half chunk of this episode, I think is important, adds a certain level of realism to it. But they, they go to uh, Raxalon, I believe that's the name of the capital, Tech is annoyed with Echo right away. We haven't seen Tom. We haven't seen much of Tom, of Tech and Echo's kind of bonding that we saw in the the second episode of the season as much at least as I would like. Mm-hmm. But, and it's just a quick little thing. But the fact that everybody's kind of at odds with this, I think, is interesting. Yeah, I, that was really obvious when he says, "Well, you've mentioned that many times." I mean, yeah. that's that's the kids in the back seat after an eight hour drive. You know, they just they <laughs> they just have kind of had enough of each other. But they're I don't know. I I still go back to I really feel like Tech and Echo have so much in common that I that either they're so alike now that they can't they can't make it happen. Or they're, they still have growing to do to to kind of come together, um, and I don't. What is it that? What is it? Why? I'm not sure why I feel that they have so much in common. Is it because of what Echo has been made into, and so he has much more technical side to him. He's got, as you said, the prosthetic arm that plugs into the um, the computer ports. Uh, he seems to always have sort of the Oh, realism, but through a perspective of surveillance. I don't know. But yeah, they're, they're, they're definitely getting testy. Well, the interesting thing about tech here is that he's always very matter of fact and just very dry, but he actually did sound annoyed. He never really sounds annoyed. He's yeah. more like, oh, yeah. here's the facts, but he's annoyed with Echo. Kind of important to see that, that human side of him. And then we jump back to Omega and Sid. Omega is clearly very bored and certainly feels left out. Uh, I wouldn't call her sad though, but, but Sid starts to taunt her uh, and they have this really captivating conversation, David, um, where, which ultimately ends up with, Oh, Omega saying, well, how much are they paying you to keep me safe? And, you know, and Sid says, not enough. Talk about mm-hmm. their dynamic, uh, mostly from a, a perspective of a, of a psychologist. What do you think is going on with these two? Well, you know, what's interesting is, is always whenever you interact with kids, um, they'll, they'll play the, um, they'll play the, um, bummed kind of thing. You know, like you said, mm-hmm. Dan, maybe not exactly sad, but kind of grumpy in the corner back turn mm-hmm. and Sid ultimately decides to interact with her. You know, Sid is playing the role here of, you know, developing Omega, and uh, and you can see it's kind of weird. I've, I've gone back and forth on Sid over the course of this season. Will she turn the Bad Batch in? Will she not? Ultimately, now, after the last couple of episodes, in particular this one, I think she does have a caring heart in there. And she tries to use something that can backfire as a coach, as a parent, um, as an educator, as you guys are, my dad was for 32 years, a high school teacher for 32 years, is can you challenge them in such a way to, to get them to step up to the plate? And she does it by saying, you know, if you didn't act so helpless, you know, those, you know, those laser brains would have taken you along. Now, ultimately, they cut away, but it seems to end up working a little bit later Um when uh, when Omega is watching Sid play uh, Dejeric, and that that line, I'm glad you brought that line when she says you don't act so helpless. I've never seen her act helpless, and I don't think Sid has ever seen her act helpless either. I that line really kind of bothered me. Like that that mm-hmm. to me was almost like a bit of a manipulation or bullying tactics. But mm-hmm. I think, like you said, that I would like to think there's a soft spot to Sid. But this is her way of, oh my gosh, I'm I'm starting to really like this kid. I can't let that happen. I got to be mean. 
Mm-hmm. Hmm. I, you know, is what what pulled on my heartstrings there was when she so she she walked off and kind of went over on the couch or the, the chair or something, and she mm-hmm. looks up and she goes, "I'm not helpless." Yeah, and I, that's the that's the line in this in this moment that really got to me, um, and I agree, uh, Dan. She, Sid, I think. I think Sid does have a soft spot, but, but, you know, we all know people who have those soft hearts, but, but have a very rough way of projecting Mm -hmm. that. And I think Mm -hmm. that's what we're, I feel like that's what we're starting to see here. Um, And I wasn't sure if the line there, the the line that I I can't get it exactly right, but is where it's, she says, they're not paying me enough or it's not enough. Mm -hmm. I wasn't sure if I should laugh at that line or kind of like, I don't know sympathetically mm-hmm. grown at that line it was right. it kind of had double meaning for me there yeah somewhere in between probably mm-hmm. which uh, which i think would be more along the lines of of the range of human emotions especially in a, in a sort of an interesting situation like the two of them are in we go back to raxus and uh record tells gs8 shows up again interesting droid kind of a combo of a death star droid and l3 but you know, uh, take that for what it's worth. I was wondering really how you like how you like yeah, G8. Yeah. <laughs> but much more, much more, uh, much more. Uh, um, I don't know. Interesting and earnest. I think is a good way to put it because she's very loyal. She's yes. very loyal to, to Senator Singh, and, and he says, you know, in, put in all. What does he say? He says, put in, follow the instructions to the letter. Is what GS8 was instructed to do. Mm-hmm. And when she meets the bad batch. Especially particularly Hunter and Echo are, are really kind of nasty to her. They're obviously not interested mm-hmm. in her ideology and her point of view or in the fact that she is a separatist and Wrecker flat out says that she has said, we aren't allies. Again, Dave, when we come back to this idea of conflict, but as we see what progresses nicely, which is a great thematic element in this episode is it doesn't matter. Yeah. You might be a separatist, but it doesn't mean you're a bad person or a bad droid or a bad entity or that I can't trust you. And we slowly kind of see that happen from this point forward in the story, don't we? Oh, no question. I I love the role that GS8 plays. I I don't know that I've actually seen, I, I guess with L3, you you see how she does act in, in solo. The, the thing that I, I think I particularly liked about GS8 was just how impressed she was with, Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, you yeah. know, uh, with with any of the things that they were doing, and uh, I'm like, I don't know that I've actually seen that before, because hers is these positive emotions, and just like you said, Dan, you know, I I started thinking about C3PO and how negative his stuff is, how worried he is, mm-hmm. how much it frustrates Han Solo, um, you know, with all of the negativity that comes out of C3PO, but GS8 is this positive, upbeat. Um, um, impressed uh, droid that I don't have you guys I don't as I scan my brain through Clone Wars episodes the movies I don't think I've seen that I don't either it would just and where there's like R2 there's like mutual English. respect oh. oh that's a good call that's a good call yeah True. that's good that's a good call I uh, the, the I think it's fun this is not related to anything specifically important but at Galaxy's Edge you can tap into the mobile uh, option for play Disney and you've got a data pad, which you can use at galaxy's mm-hmm. edge, the control panels in all of these stations that tech is using very much look almost identical to the data pad you can use it in bat too. So that's kind of a fun little Easter egg. Cool. Then Tom, we get to something that we've talked about before on these discussions of the bad batch, but it's really prevalent here. Uh, the notion of stun versus kill and yes. how the Bad Batch takes out. I, I found that really reinforced here, and I was really curious to see what you thought as well. Yeah, I think, I, you know, and I think it was even more prevalent in this one because a lot, lot more battle. That chase scene in the streets with the with the walkers and, and all of that was so great. Um, but yes, the stun is used a lot in this infiltration of the Senator's residence. And so here's where my brain went almost immediately on that, knowing that we had talked about it is when, when the, when the, when clone force 99 is looking at their adversary, they're seeing clones, Mm -hmm. especially in a place that is traditionally known as a separatist 
location. So, and Rex even says, I always thought we'd end up there, but not like this. And so in their heads, the war, they're expecting to see, they're expecting to see, um, you know, uh, uh, battle droids or something like that, but here's clones. So it's like they, it's like they can't shoot their brothers. Mm -hmm. And so instead of shooting their brothers, and even when it's the Imperial captain, um, they, they're using stun. And so that's, that's the answer I'm coming up with other than I think there's honor in clone force 99 and they know when to kill and they know when to stun. But here I think it's, it's they, they can't bring themselves to shoot their brothers. And I think it's particularly intriguing in this because we've seen a lot of star Wars stories over the years and a lot of battles between different individuals or different factions that aren't necessarily contentious, but we've never seen stun used so consistently and, and prominently. And I mm -hmm. agree. They, they see their clone brothers. They know it's because of a chip. They know it's not their fault. They continue to do it, but they're not as ready to be open-minded with the separatists that they're working with. And I just think that's cool. I mean, there's a lot of more um, interesting. There's much more interest to me as far as the psychology of, of what's going on, but I think it's very admirable and, and, and shows us again why we like the Bad Batch so much. And then there's something interesting happens, David, where Hunter brings up Omega uh, and wants her to loop around, but Tech's like, well, that's going to be hard to do because she's not here. <laughs> I love, I literally like that part, but it shows again the attachment that they have too. Oh, no question. I, I really, really enjoyed that. Uh, it's hinting at what he's wanting. He wants her to be there. Mm -hmm. uh, I was curious to see if he would leave her with Sid because he mm -hmm. doesn't trust her and said it from the very first time they met. He mm -hmm. ultimately does it because I think he took the path of the lesser of two evils. He felt mm -hmm. she would be safer than bringing her to a, a separatist planet with the Empire occupying it. But uh, um, but that was neat. And, of course, Tech's response was perfect, uh, very straightforward and uh, conveying it to him. But yeah, again, hinting at what, uh, what's, what's to come. Is there a phenomenon? Like, is there a phenomenon that where people, um, is that just sort of a self-actualization technique or what, what is he, I mean, he's not trying to do it cause he knows she's not there, but what is that when people do something like that? Well, I mean, sometimes we call it wishful thinking. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's um, just, you know, kind of we have a plan in our mind and we think about how something's going to play out um, and the persons that we want there that we're longing for. You know, something that, you know, that's difficult with the brain, and, and I was thinking about this, I'm, I've been covering it, like Dan mentioned in our psychology corner, is that when you look at the psychological literature, you can't pick the thoughts that pop into your mind but you can choose what you do with them. And so what we see with Hunter there is, is that's popping into his mind. We have it all day long. I'm talking with clients all day about it. They're like, why did I have this thought? Why did I have this thought? And our brains are nonstop, um, sometimes good, sometimes bad. Uh, but in this case, I, I think it's a, it's a good situation. But there's not an actual name for that, Dan, but just more of a natural thing of our brains never stop running. Can we name it the Motters effect? <laughs> <laughs> I like it. We'll take it. Yeah. Let's, put it, let's <laughs> publish that in the paper, my friend. I need that. <laughs> so Omega and Sid are back again. Uh, we have the we have the really quick thing with the priceless vase that they talk about, which pays off later. But <laughs> Omega is watching Sid play the Jark. And she's like, she starts yelling advice and Sid's like, oh, really? What does she call her? An expert? Is that what she calls her an expert? Mm, I think so, yeah. Yeah. But but it doesn't have the same tone of condescension that she has when she call when she gives the Clone Force 99 their nicknames. Um, and then we we find out, Tom, that the two of them are, are basically going to work with each other for mutual advantage. Talk about your observations on that whole arrangement that the two of them have. And just kind of seeing it to me, and Mason loved this seeing Omega being really, really good at this. Yes. Um, first of all, I, I really like the sequence of events that have gone through that we've discussed with Omega and Sid. Mm -hmm. You know, we go from the the sad, kind of disappointed Omega to the, to the Omega that's called helpless um, to now she's going to show 
some value, some worth, or we're going to show that she's learned something, which to me has been sort of the theme of all of this going along yeah. is so far is that Omega Omega is not your typical child. She doesn't just sort of go day to day. She is picking up, she is learning and she's gathering and we see her use those skills here. So yeah, when she watches and, and uh, calls out uh, Sid's game, um, Sid sees that there's a, there's a, something good here. And, and she says, how are you so good at this? And she says, it's a strategy game. I'm good at strategy. And so now we know what kind of brain she has. You know, mm -hmm. we, we, we knew that all along, but now we're going to see it come to play. And so Sid gets this great idea that uh, we're going to, we're going to make profit off of this. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, which is Sid's game, but Omega has learned the art of the deal. Yes. yes, And, yes. Uh, and she, she says, well, what's in it for me? And Sid says, I'll what's give you, cut? and I forget, yeah. what's my cut? Yeah, she uses the language. What's my cut? And and Sid's, was it 30%? She says 30%. 30, and, and then Omega goes 60. 60%, yep. And so Omega has learned the art of the deal by sitting in Sid's place. Um, you know, all of that. And feels pretty confident about it. And so I just, I saw that. I, I'm seeing how Sid is going to be a piece of, of Omega's puzzle. Um, and that she's going to learn from her and has learned from her uh, that I think some, you know, things will come into play later. Isn't it fantastic too, that Omega isn't asking or being wishy-washy. She's telling Sid, yeah. this master who's able to walk this fine line of underworld and, and um, the right of the line of possible peace and justice. Well, I guess we'll find out. But she's just declaring it. She's not asking it. She's saying to one of the toughest, uh, basically, gangsters around, no, it's going to be 60%. And Sid does it. I love yeah. that. So I tell you what, let's go ahead and take a quick break. When we come back, we will talk more about Common Ground. This is Coffee with Kenobi. This is Vanessa Marshall, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi. With travel beginning to open up and Walt Disney World and Disneyland reaching full capacity, this is the time to book your Disney World vacation with MEI and Mouse Fan Travel. Their signature service and expert advice will help clients maximize their vacation time and dollar. I use Becky Mencken and MEI's incredible services all the time, both for family and for travel for the show because of their no cost, no obligation quote when you use the service. Plus, they proactively adjust the booking if the rate goes down. Literally, I will wake up one morning and I'll get an email from MEI saying that the price went down and I will get a refund sent to my credit card right away. I don't have to do anything. They help your family enjoy everything Galaxy's Edge and the Disney theme parks and the cruise lines have to offer. Can help you plan every detail and always share invaluable tips. That's for Walt Disney World, Disneyland, the Disney Cruise Lines, or other cruise lines. It doesn't have to be Disney-related. They literally can help you plan a vacation anywhere on the planet. Be sure to go to www.coffeewithkenobi.com slash mousefantravel and sign up for a free no-obligation quote to any of the Disney theme parks on the planet or any vacation that you have in mind. You'll have the best vacation possible and help out me and Coffee with Kenobi in the process. We are back talking about Common Ground, the 10th episode in season one of Star Wars, The Bad Batch. We just talked about the new converse, uh, the new plan or partnership that Omega and Sid have. Then we jump back, of course, to what's going on uh, with The Bad Batch themselves. Uh, there's this great... Well, first, let's talk about Captain Bragg, uh, David, and the Imperial Interrogation Droid. Captain Bragg, I believe this is the first time that we've seen her... What do you make of her so far? Yeah, another um, uh, pawn in the whole scheme who is wanting to work her way up the Imperial ladder. And, uh, yep. you know, um, she's not deliciously evil, but she's pretty evil and pretty slick mm -hmm. and pretty, pretty um, kind of uh, she presents in a way that is uh, She's, she's willing to hurt you in any way she can uh, to make you do what she wants. Uh, when you bring in an interrogation droid, those things always strike me as, as again, so intimidating with the needle right on the front of it. But uh, <laughs> she's, a, she's a good baddie for this particular role. Uh, but um, fortunately, our guys come in and, and save the day for 
the senator. Yeah, those, those interrogation droids, the best use of those droids was in that Star Wars. There was a, three novels that came out that basically told this, the stories of the original trilogy from the character's points of view. And every chapter was from a different character's point of view. And I can never remember the author of that first one. Tom uh, Engelberg that did the Origami Yoda. Oh, He wrote, yeah. I believe, mm-hmm. The Return of the Jedi one. Mm-hmm. I think that's right. But the, I can't remember who did the new one, but there's this great thing where they actually show what happens to Leia when she gets injected by the interrogation droid and what it does to your psyche. So it, it's definitely no joke. And it, it goes to stands to reason that people in the star Wars universe would know how dangerous it is. But as you said, the bad bat shows up, saves the day using their stun to full effect. And then Tom, there's this great action sequence. I'd love for you to walk us through where they take over this Walker. There's, there's some great, great, like Jackie Chan level stuff here. Yeah. Um, so uh, it's picking up where the interrogation droid, which every time those things show up, I wonder, oh, how are we going to get out of this? How, and then, of course, a grenade <laughs> a grenade pops in. Yeah, baby. <laughs> that was great. And that was one of the first. Um, and I, I feel like the captain caught just a random stun shot. I don't think I, I think they're just shooting through the smoke. And because I, I felt like they, they, you know, a couple of them were intentional. And then I think she just got a random shot. And that was I was it was pleasing to watch the captain go down in a st- stun shot. <laughs> but yes, so they get, so they, they pick up uh, the Senator uh, there and they get to the top of the building and they look and um, Omega and tech are kind of scanning the, the situation. And I believe it was echo that finds a, uh, a Walker coming down kind of an alley behind mm-hmm. the, the Senator's residence. And he says, we're going to get into that one. We're going to, we're going to, uh, commandeered that one and so they fire that zip line down to the uh down to the walker and uh slip down there and it was great just the whole sequence of of and i don't remember they got the gunner first and stunned the gunner when they came down and then they open up the hatch and drop the stun grenade down in there and Love then they that. open up the cockpit and and i mean it was it was just like pow 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 and it was all with good heart because of all of the <laughs> it was just all stun except <laughs> when they well so yeah a lot of i'm sorry i'm skipping some things i'm moving i'm getting too far ahead of myself um sing says well you can't possibly expect me to do that and <laughs> wrecker looks down shakes his head grabs the senator and says uh, it says, just don't look down. And I just, I love that it was, I, you know, it's ironic that it's, it's uh-huh. record that's doing that and gives the advice, don't look down. And he slides down there. And then, so when, when you stun somebody, they're going to come back. Right. And so they show, they cut to a scene where the side of the Walker is open and Wrecker is just tossing them out like today's trash. You know, he's just throwing them out of the stunned uh, clones out of the Walker. And he says, they'll feel that in the morning. And it's just, I mean, it was just a wonderful kind of humorous piece in, in this whole sequence. And I did want to, mention here that I just want to say, and we've said this in every, almost every single episode we've done in reviewing this, it was here that I sort of pulled myself out in the second viewing and really made note of the music in this, mm-hmm. in this action sequence. Mm-hmm. The music was spot on. And what made me, what made me become conscious of it was every time another Walker showed up in an alley, there was this moment of like, musical horns that like wah, like here comes another one and it just was like a warning sound inside the the score i just thought it was beautiful and so then i just sort of tuned out i closed my eyes and just listened to the music and the sound of the of the uh of the sequence and it just was it was magnificent um i'm trying to think if there's anything else i i mean i can go so far as as then they they finally they hit the they they their walker gets struck from behind and you feel like oh well that was barely worth the effort but they go out they repair it there's some great street action but then they get back in and i love that the senator the separatist senator avi singh says go down that street turn right here and they're like that's a dead end and he goes just trust me 
And mm -hmm. wow, what a great moment in this whole mm -hmm. in this whole episode where there's so much distrust. And he says, just trust me. And he leads them to an escape where they blow a hole. They like they lay the walker down sideways. They blow a hole in the door in the wall. And he says, there's a there's an underground passage here. And and it's it's the great escape. It was it was a wonderful sequence. It, it was really, really compelling. The uh, there's a lot of great action moments. Uh, Wrecker grabbing the center and jumping down, you know, throwing in that that um well, I don't even know what it's called, but it, it basically deactivates all the electronics inside uh the walker yeah. itself. And then um a great moment where Hunter does this really cool sliding move no. um and climbs up the side. And I just it was cool to see Hunter in that role again because sometimes <laughs> we don't get to see that from him lately. Kind of redeem himself from getting taken down out by Cad Bane, right? Uh, they'll feel that in the morning was a great line. Isn't it interesting, David, that we're going to stun the clones. We had no problem throwing them out of an ATT <laughs> when they're unconscious. <laughs> I don't know. Well, right. You know, I, I had a question for both of you because I was watching the episode again tonight. It was my third time going through it. And I'm like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Their walker gets hit from behind. Their back end goes down. And, and watching it for the third time, you see all of this oil just gushing out the back of their ATT. Yeah. So then Tex says, hey, we've got to go outside and manually fix this. And so they go out and like, like you said, Dan, here goes Hunter, here goes Wrecker. And they're just running and gunning, doing the stun, um, avoiding getting shot by every clone trooper out there that wants to take them out. And then you see... Uh, tech ultimately saying um, it's almost completed. I'm like, how is it from the control pad that tech has? Because I thought they were getting out of the ATTE to go back there and work on it, meaning uh, 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 tech and echo, but yeah. I don't see anybody work on it. No. And they come back. <laughs> no Allen wrench, no nothing. No Allen, nothing. And, and, and of course they jump back on and they're going. And I'm like, wait, 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 wait. I think I missed something. Did I miss yeah. something? There was no manual fixing to that. And so I've mentioned this before when I've recorded with Aaron, a lot of times he and I fall back on, uh, you know, the, the classic term we talk about in movies, the suspension of disbelief. Mm -hmm. And so in my mind, I said, okay, suspension of disbelief, tech fixed it. I know he got it. He can do it with that little, he can do anything with his handheld little computer there. So I went with it, but uh, it's yeah. Between it's <laughs> widely known, and in, in we were, of course in the Star Wars book that the Bluetooth is how you fix an ATTE, right? <laughs> <Just> <laughs> yeah, I I caught that too. I'm like, he's fixing with that thing. Is this like his Deus Ex Machina? Can do everything, but it's whatever. Oh, you know, thought, it's whatever. I thought Echo went. I thought Echo was under there with him. But even, okay. even though they didn't, you'd think they had to get outside. And like if, it, if it's collapsed, maybe there's a leak. I don't know. I guess it doesn't matter. That's like when people got upset watching The Last Jedi about how, why are they following each other so closely. It's Star Wars. You know, I, I don't, I don't right. need it to make sense. But, but I did see that. It did take me out of it for a split second as well. So I understand exactly what you're saying. Uh, the uh, Senator Singh has this, this vase that's supposed to be invaluable. He uses it to smash... Uh, some of the clones yeah. to help distract them. He says, I didn't really like that anyway. A fun little moment of character that backs up what mm -hmm. you had said earlier, Tom. But then he has to trust the separatists, like you mentioned, David, which is great. And then there's this great part of strategy, Tom, that I love, where he says, hey, smash this wall here, um, and we're going to get through here. It's basically like an escape. This is a hollow wall, in essence, leading to somewhere else. They blow it up, they break through, and then Wrecker sets the charges to create another wall I don't know why, but that was so satisfying and so interesting to me. It was just a simple explosion, but the fact that the ATTE door closes, the explosion goes up, they open again, sneak through, reseal it. I just thought that was so much fun. It's so simple, but I really enjoyed that. I don't, you know, I don't know. I, I thought it I thought it was one more example of their their tactical, like mm -hmm. the way the the Bad Batch or Clone Force 99 does things. And it was just sort of like the period at the end of the sentence when he did that. I noted that as well, how he mm -hmm. covered their escape 
And it just, you know, and it's not like someone had to tell record to do that. It was part of their protocol. And I thought yep. it was, it was solid story, storytelling there C- completed it. Kind of a James Bond, the Indiana Jones sort of a, sort of a tactic, yeah. but it works mm-hmm. great. They escape, uh, they get to the shuttle and then the Senator has this moment. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Kind of, it's somewhat predictable, I guess, if you think about classic stories over the years. But it takes a bit of a, of a side turn, doesn't it, David? Talk about – I love that we have you on because it's always great to talk with you no matter what. But the fact that you're coming at this from the perspective of a psychologist, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Did, did, he, did the senator do the right thing here? What, what is the right thing here? Well, you know, um, one of the biggest core issues in humans is, is conflict. What is the right thing, particularly when you're presented with a couple different options? Ultimately, uh, he, I believe he did make the right decision because, you know, even Echo backs it up and says, live to fight another day. Now, again, I know the rest of the story. All of us sitting here do. Uh, what this senator does is not going to matter because Palpatine's going to do what Palpatine's going to do. But this senator, Avi Singh, doesn't know this. So ultimately, he can go back and be captured and probably killed versus held captive, because I'm sure Captain Bragg is really happy after everything that went down there, and that and she's embarrassed by what occurred. So if he goes back, he's going to die, and he's not going to be of any help whatsoever. But by leaving, he can at least try to be a voice, try to be something positive uh, in the time being. We know that, you know, even in my show notes here, I was just looking – it's not till Rogue One or, or Ep Four till we really see the rebellion starting to turn the tide. But at that point, at that time, the conflict between wanting to stay with his people, I get that. But if he stays, he's going to die. He can say more from a distance. Um, you know, you just got me thinking about something, Dan. I just flashed back. You and I were talking about rebels uh, last Wednesday night, yeah. and and I think about Ezra on the radio or the comm. You know, and he is doing what his parents did, uh, which is fighting the good fight, encouraging the people from a safe place. And, you know, this particular senator could perhaps try to do the same thing. And uh, but, yeah, conflict is always going to be there. Ultimately, I think he picked the right thing. He would have been killed if he went back. Right. And it's very noble and admirable. And and I think there's I think he inspires the Bad Batch or at least allows the idea for them to alter their perspective. And hey, mm-hmm. you know, some clones are dangerous now. Not all of us are. Some separatists are, are dangerous. Some are not. Uh, mm-hmm. It's the Empire we got to worry about. That's our common enemy. But I thought it was really, really cool. Uh, Tom, do you want to say anything about this before we uh, come to the last part of this of the show? Uh, yeah, I would love to. I, I just, I felt like, I felt like we've seen this scene before. And, and it reminded me very much of, as you were saying, David, the, the rebellion. It seems like something that I've heard rebels say to people who have lost hope, come with us, join with us, live to live for another day. And, and I thought it was cool that Echo's the one that, you know, I think G, uh, GS8 said something about, and then Echo says, she's right live to fight another day. And I was like, man, if that's not like the, the line of the rebellion, I don't know what is. And, um, and so, and it just, yeah, I think that's all I, I really needed to say about that. Mm. And the fact that echoes the one who says live to fight another day. I yeah. think that's so important because he was the one who is the most staunch of a critic of all of them. And he has that response. Respect, the, that mutual admiration they have for, oh, I don't know, admiration probably is too strong word, but mutual respect is certainly there. So we go back so much for keeping a low profile as Omega has got the place packed. Shids is as packed as we have ever seen it. She's is going up against Pantoran playing Dejaric. Everybody's around rooting for her, and she never ever seems to be the slightest bit concerned or intimidated at all, but she never does. Uh, she's a natural. I've never seen anything like it is Sid's response, but she sets everybody up uh, and then wins this match. I, I, I love this so much. I find her to be quite inspirational. I'm here for it. Yeah. The, you know, something, and I mentioned it at the beginning, um, 
when we were just talking about our initial thoughts is, you know, you asked me, Dan, to talk about that conversation between Hunter and Omega. And you can see in her, she wants to be useful. Um, on my board, in my office, I have a, a large whiteboard. And I have a lot written up there, but I have four words written up there that I talk about with children, adolescents, and now primarily with my clients who are who are uh, retired. They're, uh, it's a geriatric population that I'm working with. And they're challenged with the same thing that you see Omega being challenged with, which is, I'm retired. I don't have a job, David. My spouse has died, my husband or my wife. My body is not cooperating with me. Um, I've outlived all my friends. Um, I don't feel useful. And so on my board, I have four words, purposeful, valuable, useful, hopeful. And I talk with my clients and I tell them, that's how I see you. That's how I see all my clients, no matter what age they are. So when I saw this with Omega, I loved it as well, Dan, because you see her as useful and she can see herself as useful. People want to be this way. You can see it in us from a young age all the way up to when people are retired. I've got clients who are retired who they can't help their husband or wife do the dishes. They can't stand there long enough to dry them because their back aches. And so there's this incredible drive in us to feel useful. So it was really neat to see her feel this way. Now, the other thing that, that it got me thinking about, uh, Dan and, and Tom, is, and I'm, I'm looking at my show notes here, is just this idea of what do we make of this skill? You know, it's strategy. And just like you said, Dan, here is Sid, who is this, again, this top notch, you know, you know, uh, uh, you know, underground type of, of character who's saying, I've never seen anything like it, really building her up. But between that skill, that skill of strategy, as well as what we heard Tex say in a previous episode about her being an unaltered clone, in my mind, the question is, is that enough to save the Kaminoans? Mm -hmm. Right. You know, and that's just right. something that I've been thinking about. And as you know, and of course, I listen to you guys each week and talking about what is the goal of the Bad Batch? Where are they going? Um, and I guess that's one other thing that plays off of what uh, Omega does. Not only feels useful, but here she is as part of the team getting them out from underneath debt, which is a great thing. And so it'll be neat to see, particularly if we're a little tired of, of hearing Sid's commentary if they start to move off planet and, and head on some other adventures here as we head towards the end of the season. I'd like to see that. I would like to see that as well. And I, I also think it's important, and Tom, I'd love to hear what you think about this as well, that Omega and Sid, Omega is not being used by Sid. Sid is not being used by Omega, but Omega is using this for to her advantage. She uses this to pay off the debt of Clone Force 99. All that Mantel mix is paid for. Everything is paid for. She is she is taking care of that. She is showing them Clone Force ninety nine. Whether I'm in the field with you or I'm here, I am useful. I'm a brilliant strategist, and I'm not apologizing for that. It, it, she's just so so dynamic and fascinating to me because she's not cocky, or arrogant. She just is. She's yeah. just this force of nature. Mm -hmm. And I know you watch this with your girls, uh, definitely with your older, uh, especially. But what did they make about this? And what, what did you think about how Omega leveraged this to her advantage? I, I have to say, when you were talking about this, I, I said to Kaylee, what, what, would, what grade would you give this one? Uh, and she said to me something that just floored me. She goes, Dad, this is my favorite one. Mm -hmm. I said, really? Cool. I said, tell me why. And, and she goes, well, look at Omega. She's like independent. She's mm -hmm. succeeding mm -hmm. on her own. She said mm -hmm. the, the Bad Batch had nothing to do with her success. And she says, if anything, Hunter tried to, tried to limit her, which kind of was, made me feel kind of bad as her father because I feel like I, you know, as, a, as fathers, that's, that, that's, that's our job, right? To limit yeah. our kids and keep, hold them back. <laughs> protect them. <laughs> but protect, them. Yeah. And but but yeah. she's she, I, was, I was like wow she is she is watching this through a filter that I I'm not and uh, and I just thought that That's was great. really cool and she said that um, but uh, but you know so I I really thought this 
this episode was almost as much about her as it was about Clone Force 99. And we, and it, the funny, the reason I say that is because we're set up to believe she's being left behind. Well, not Omega. You're not going to leave Omega behind. Mm-hmm. Um, do you mind if I jump into uh, a kind of another point that deals with Omega here at the end? Please. It regard re- regarding Hunter. Um, so we've talked numerous times uh, throughout this season about the father daughter relationship. And I thought this is the one, and we didn't really grade this one at the beginning, but, uh, but this last, I don't know how long was it four minutes, two minutes. I don't even remember. It's not very long. This last section here is a plus in my eyes. Their relationship is so well defined here. And really sort of the relationship of all of them is defined here because Hunter comes in and scolds Omega almost to the point where he's like pointing his finger at her. He he doesn't do that physically, but I hear it in his voice. And, and this is where Sid steps in and uses her language. Ease up bandana. She says, and I was like, Oh, that grates on me. But at the same time, I'm kind of seeing where she's going she paid off your debt and she drops the bomb. She paid, she paid off your debt. Show some gratitude. And then this is the Respect. part. Mm-hmm. You weren't going to get, you weren't, no one shows Hunter up. In close, Clone Force 99, nobody shows Hunter up. But Wrecker does the old shoulder and gives him the eye over, over, mm-hmm. his, over his shoulder. So bumps into him, looks back at him like, come on, man. But doesn't do it disrespectfully to where it's in front of Omega. Omega doesn't see this happen. Mm -hmm. And I was like, man, how many times as a father did I overreact on something Mm -hmm. and really put my kids in their play in quote their place and then get the look for my wife. Or in some cases I get the look for my other kid looking at me like, really dad, really was it that big a deal? And I felt like that's kind of what happened here. And, uh, and, and Hunter gives pause to it. Um, and, uh, and so he, 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 he shifts the gears, you know, I go back to, to episode two where, um, oh, oh, the clone, um, uh, Cut. what's his name? Cut. Cut. Yes. Where he teaches him kind of how to be a father and you see Hunter throughout the rest of the season kind of applying those and he does it here and he asks the question, you really paid off our debts? And she says, I wanted to help out even though I couldn't go on the mission. And so he does, here's where he does the right thing. He says, he, he wants to play a game. Let's play a game. Let's do something that you enjoy. Rather than me continuing to lecture, rather than me, no, no one says sorry here at the end. Mm-hmm. You know, no sorries are given. And so he says, um, well, I guess there is kind of a sorry. It's just, it's between the lines. And he, he says, let's play a game. Brings it down to her level. Show me what you, it's basically a show me what you can do. You know, I want to be the proud papa. Show me, show me how you do this. You know, teach me something and uh, makes the deal. And it's, it's a great parenting deal, my friends, because he's already decided when he calls for her action during the mission, he's already made the decision that she's not going to stay home anymore. She's going on these missions, but she puts the power in her hands. And he says, tell you what, you win. There's no more sitting out. How's that? And and I love the way it concludes. The look on her face. She gets so excited. Like she, her, her eyes light up. She runs around the table and he says, are you ready? And her line is gold. Are you? <laughs> it's so Michael Jordan. It's so Michael Jordan. Yep. Are you? And she just says it like without any pretenses. We're like, no, actually, I've got the upper hand here, buddy. It's a brilliant, yep. brilliant thing. And, and I love it. that we don't get to see the game. I love that we don't get to see what happens. That drove Mason crazy. I'm like sometimes play <laughs> oh. the questions more important than the answer. Pretty sure that we'll, yeah. when we see our missions, we'll know what happens. It's like at the end of Rocky Three when you don't, you know, they're about to punch and you don't see who's actually going to win the fight. <laughs> yeah, so good. I love that oh. ending. I thought that was very a very charming one. And I can't believe this, but for the first time this season, I didn't start the show with a letter grade and overall reaction. But we're done talking yeah. about the episode, so. Dave, uh, Dave, what would you have said would be your letter grade and your overall reactions to this episode? Well, look, I I have channeled my inner Tom on many an episode where, 
<laughs> I love it when Tom, I'm trying to remember when he said it. He's like, Dan, I reserve the right to change my letter grade if people make good arguments throughout the episode. <laughs> and, and I just, I have totally taken that, Tom, and I've stolen it from you. And I've absolutely applied it and changed my letter grades. At the beginning, um, I was comparing this to the last two episodes. And I love Fennec Shan. I love Cad Bane. Uh, the action with the bounty hunters. And I had rated those A's. I had this at like a B. But after what Tom said there about the ending, and of course my favorite Bad Batcher, Wrecker, um, when Tom presented that about the little shoulder shrug, and I remember it, and he looks at him, but does it in a very subtle, socially skilled way. And it helps kind of guide Hunter and think about it. And Hunter's changing. Uh, and all the other comments that, that Tom has made here at the end, and I have a daughter, a 14-year-old daughter, and Tom, I have never overreacted, and I've never had my wife give me the look, and I've never had my, I am absolutely what you described, I've done all of it, and I'm like, oh, why did I react like that? And we've all done it, and so I love that you said it, and it's very much influenced, you know, my thoughts on the grade, and uh, I'm going to bump it up to, I would say, from, to an A- minus for me, whereas A for the last two of uh, this one, um, an A-, minus. and I'll say this, Dan, you have a wonderful psychologist on the show with you every week named Tom Gross. Wow. There you go. That's wow. Fire. There you go. I'm adding that. CWK psychologist. <laughs> That's right. Not just newsman. <laughs> yeah. So you said you bumped it up. Was it yeah. originally going to be a B plus? I, I had it as a B. A compared B? Compared okay. to the A of the previous two weeks. Okay. Yep. Well, Tom, what, what would you have? What was your letter grade? Would it would it have changed? I think no, um, no. I kept mine the same. It, my my letter grade uh, to start was A minus, and mm -hmm. then and then that last two minutes I thought was A mm -hmm. plus when you connect it to the full season, but no, A minus mm -hmm. was where I was going, and I was so surprised at how many people and and I, I guess I should say I was surprised but understood. Um, so many people were just kind of disappointed in the episode as a comparison. I think there's a lot of reading between the lines on this one, which is why I think a second viewing uh, on this one is absolutely necessary. And I can't wait. To, I'm, this is one I'm going to watch again a, a third time because of our conversation tonight for right. sure. But uh, but I feel like there's a lot of there's a lot going on under the sea under you know underneath on this one to where yeah it doesn't have the action. It doesn't have the fist fights. It doesn't have the bounty hunters. But between the two stories that are happening side by side on this one, there's a lot going on that I think develops stuff going forward. Good, good. Well, I, I was going to give this one an A minus. I still feel like it's an A minus. And I, I saw some of it, like in the CWK Cafe, I saw some people weren't as sure about this, which I totally respect. And that's why we have mm -hmm. our amazing Star Wars community and why you can go to coffeewithcomedy.com yeah. slash community and be a part of that conversation because we get to give instant reactions and then spoiler filled reaction 48 hours later. But I, I was a little surprised because to me, this felt very Clone Warsy. Uh, it tackles some difficult themes consistently and gives some nice resolution, opening up some new ideas and what they do with Omega continues to be very interesting and, and captivating mm -hmm. And I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a great, when it was done, I looked at Mason. I said, I, I think that one's great. I think that one's a lot of fun. It, it had a little more uh, gravity to it than uh, several of the other episodes. Not saying the others were bad, but this one had more gravity and more cost to it. Great fun. Listening to Coffee with Kenobi, you are with Dan Z, the podcast you're looking for. This is... <laughs> As we near the end of the show today, I want to thank each and every one of you for taking time out of your busy schedule to have a cup of coffee with me and for helping to spread the word about our Star Wars family we've got here at Coffee with Kenobi. Be sure to tune in Monday nights at 8 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time on Facebook Live at www.coffeewithkenobi.com slash live or www.facebook.com slash coffeewithkenobi.com. 
and have a cup of coffee, tea, or any beverage of your choosing with me as we continue the conversation. To join us in the CWK Cafe, which is our Facebook group, and share your Star Wars thoughts, comments, reviews, and opinions in a family-friendly, spoiler-free place that is also drama-free, go to www.coffeewithkenobi.com slash community and be part of the conversation, talk about this week's show, or just talk about some Star Wars. We have a lot of fun, and you'll make some new friends as well as catch up with longtime friends along the way. I also want to thank all of the new and longtime members of the CWK Alliance and let you know how much I appreciate your help and encouragement. If you want to join the CWK Alliance, go to www.cwkalliance.com and sign up today. Not only will you help out Coffee with Kenobi, but you also get access to CWK Pour Over, the exclusive weekly podcast not heard anywhere else. It's a great way to support and help out the show, and 10% of your monthly contributions go directly to the St. Jude Children's Hospital to support the incredibly important work they are doing to help these brave children and their families. Plus, contributors at the CWK All-Star level can watch a video podcast of CWK Pour Over hosted by me, Tom Gross, and Corey Club. Feel free to reach out anytime if you have any questions. In addition to being part of the community on Facebook, please don't forget to visit our website at www.coffeewithkenobi.com for Star Wars news, announcements, reviews, videos and so much more if you have a question for me or just want to share your thoughts on the air feel free to email me at dan z at coffee with and i'll share them on the show you can also connect with me on twitter at mr zare m-r-z-e-h-r or on instagram at dan zare c-w-k there are also a lot more ways to connect with me and coffee with kenobi on social media follow us on twitter and instagram give us a like on facebook at facebook.com slash coffee with kenobi Check us out on Pinterest or subscribe to our Coffee with Kenobi YouTube channel. On our YouTube channel, you can find Facebook Live video, different interviews throughout the years, highlights of video coverage throughout the Coffee with Kenobi history, and the audio podcast itself. You can order my book, The Star Wars Book, which I co-wrote with Lucasfilm's Pablo Hidalgo and Cole Horton on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Target, Books A Million, Walmart, or anywhere books are sold. You can also find my writing on Coffee with Kenobi's website, as well as StarWars.com, where I am an official blogger there, and on IGN, where I contribute occasionally to articles about Star Wars, as well as other popular culture topics. If you are considering starting a podcast or a blog, let me know how I can help you get started and make your creative vision a reality. Be sure to check out DanzyMedia.com and we can get the process started. I am also available to come to your school, conference, business, or organization to talk about how to tap into your strengths and help you bring out your very best. I want to inspire you to be inspired so you can take that first step into a larger world. Thanks as always to our Coffee with Kenobi sponsors, especially MEI and Mouse Fan Travel, our travel partner and your one-stop shop for all things Walt Disney World, Disneyland, the Disney Cruise Lines, or anywhere on the planet you want to go on your vacation. Please go to www.coffeewithkenobi.com slash Mouse Fan Travel to book your magical vacation and help support Coffee with Kenobi in the process. If you like the show, please tweet out that you're listening, share it on Facebook, or invite your friends and family to tune in and share a cup of coffee with us. And if the force is especially with you, please take a couple of minutes to rate and review the show on iTunes or Google Podcasts. Every review makes a huge difference and helps to spread the word, and I can't thank you enough for your help for your support and your friendship. I love so much being a part of this wonderful Star Wars community, and I can't thank you enough for all that you do for me and Coffee with Kenobi. Uh, as we wrap up this show, uh, David, please let everybody know where they can continue the conversation with you and let everybody know, if they don't already, where to find, listen, and subscribe to Star Wars Reactions. Oh, definitely. Um, you know, the best ways to follow uh, myself and my co-host, Aaron Harris, is uh, at our Twitter uh, addresses. The the one for the podcast is at SW Reactions Pod. My Twitter is at David underscore Modders, and it's M O D D E R S. There's an S on the end. My co host is at T A Harris 121079, so definitely hit him up as well. Uh, we're on Instagram at SW Reactions, Facebook at SW Reactions. And if people want to talk even in more depth with me about anything Star Wars, and we also say psychology, uh, after my Psychology Corner post with each episode, uh, my email is david 
at StarWarsReactions.com. And I just want to say thank you, Dan, for talking about that. And and uh, you and I talked about it a bit last Wednesday when we got together down at Disney Springs. And it's just been a joy to to put those together and really give away psychology at a time when people are so incredibly stressed and depressed and anxious. And so right now I've been going through different techniques to help people uh, deal with uh, with stress, depression, and anxiety. So uh, they can go to any of the podcatcher, uh, podcatchers and we're there at Star Wars Reactions and they'll find us. And uh, thank you for all your support. Oh, my pleasure, man. Thank you for what you do for so many people um, that we don't even know know anything about. So thank you so much for that. Yeah. And Tom, where you put a lot of positivity in the galaxy as well, let everybody know about <laughs> where they can find you and your work. Oh, thank you. Um, yes, catch me on Twitter at DraftLine. And then check out my blog, Seeking Positivity in the Galaxy. Last week I did a, a post about the name Omega and some of my yes. thoughts of uh, where that uh, is going or may be going, as well as uh, just some thoughts on the show in general. So check that out, Seeking Positivity in the Galaxy. A big thank you to Tom and David for joining me today to talk about Common Ground, the most recent episode of The Bad Batch, the 10th episode, in fact, of The Bad Batch, which means there are only six episodes left in this first incredible season. I want to thank everybody again who joined me for the CWK meetup last week at Jock Lindsay's Hangar Bar at Disney Springs, as well as who watched along live as I took everybody through a video tour of Galaxy's Edge on Facebook Live. That was so much fun, and that was where I announced that I'm going to be releasing very soon an audio tour walkthrough of Galaxy's Edge for both Disneyland and Walt Disney World. I cannot wait to share more information about that, especially the release date, as well as an ebook I'm working on giving you all you need to know about Galaxy's Edge and a guidebook to help you get the most out of your Walt Disney World vacation, especially as a Star Wars fan. Have a great week and weekend, everybody. And remember, this is the podcast you're looking for. This podcast is not endorsed by the Walt Disney Company or Lucasfilm Limited. It is intended for entertainment and informational purposes only. The official Star Wars website can be found at www.starwars.com. Star Wars, all names, sounds, and any other Star Wars related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Disney and their respective trademark and copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of Coffee with Kenobi unless otherwise indicated. This is the podcast you're looking for. There's no one here.